Section 18 of Jailed for Freedom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet O'Reilly of Utah. www.oreilly-fire.com. Jailed for Freedom by Doris Stevens. Part 3, Chapter 19, More Pressure. Our immediate task was to compel the President to secure a reversal of two votes in the Senate. It became necessary to enter again the congressional elections, which were a month away. By a stroke of good luck, there were two senatorial contests in New Jersey and New Hampshire for vacancies in the short term. That is, we had an opportunity to elect two friends who would take their seats in time to vote on the amendment before the end of this session it so happened that the democratic candidates were pledged to vote for the amendment if elected and that the republican candidates were opposed to the amendment we launched our campaign in this instance for the election of the democratic candidates we went immediately to the president to ask his assistance in our endeavor we urged him personally to appeal to the voters of new jersey and new hampshire on behalf of his two candidates as party leader he was at the moment paying no attention whatever to the success of these two suffrages both of the democratic candidates themselves appealed to president wilson for help in their contest on the basis of their suffrage advocacy his speech to the senate scarcely cold the president refused to lend any assistance in these contests which with sufficient effort might have produced the last two votes it was clear that he would move again only under attack we went again therefore to the women voters of the west and asked them to withhold their support from the democratic senatorial candidates in the suffrage states in order to compel the president to assist in the two eastern contest this campaign made it clear to the president that we were still holding him and his party to their responsibility and as has been pointed out our policy was to oppose the democratic candidates at elections as long as their party was responsible for the passage of the amendment and did not pass it since there is no question between individuals in suffrage states they are all suffragists this could not increase our numerical strength it could however and did demonstrate the growing and comprehensive power of the women voters shortly before before election when our campaign was in full swing in the west the president sent a letter appealing to the voters of new jersey to support mr hennessy the democratic candidate for the senate he subsequently appealed to the voters of new hampshire to elect mr jameson candidate for democratic senator in new hampshire we continued our campaign in the west as a safeguard against relaxation by the president after his appeal there were seven senatorial contests in the western suffrage states in all but two of these contests montana and nevada the democratic senate senatorial candidates were defeated in these two states the democratic majority was greatly reduced republicans won in new jersey and new hampshire and a republican congress was elected to power throughout the country the election campaign had had a wholesome effect however on both parties and was undoubtedly one of the factors in persuading the president to again appeal to the senate immediately after the defeat in the senate and throughout the election campaign we attempted to hold banners at the capitol to assist our campaign and in order to weaken the resistance of the senators of the opposition the mottoes on the banners attacked with impartial mercilessness both democrats and republicans one read senator wadsworth's regiment is fighting for democracy abroad senator wadsworth left his regiment and is fighting against democracy in the senate senator wadsworth could serve his country better by fighting with his regiment abroad than by fighting women at home another read senator shields told the people of tennessee he would support the president's policies the only time the president went to the senate to ask its support senator shields voted against him does tennessee back the president's war program or senator shields and still a third germany has established equal universal secret direct franchise the senate has denied equal universal secret suffrage to america which is more of a democracy germany or america as the women approached the senate colonel higgins the sergeant at arms of the senate ordered a squad of capitol policemen to rush upon them they wrenched their banners from them twisting their wrists and manhandling them as they took them up the steps through the door and down into the guard their banners confiscated and they themselves detained for varying periods of time when the women insisted on knowing upon what charges they were held they were merely told that peace and order must be maintained on the capitol grounds and further it don't make no difference about the law colonel higgins is the boss here and he has taken the law in his own hands day after day this performance went on small detachments of women attempted to hold banners outside the united state senate as the women of holland had done outside the parliament in the hague it was difficult to believe that
that American politicians could be so devoid of humor as they showed themselves. The panic that overwhelms our official mind in the face of the slightest irregularity is appalling. Instead of maintaining peace and order, the squads of police managed to keep the Capitol grounds in a state of confusion. They were assisted from time to time by Senate pages, small errand boys who would run out and attack mature women with impunity. The women would be held under the most rigid detention each day until the Senate had safely adjourned. Then, on the morrow, the whole spectacle would be repeated. While the United States Senate was standing still under our protest, world events rushed on. Germany autocracy had collapsed. The Allies had won a military victory. The Kaiser had that very week fled for his life because of the uprising of his people. We are all free voters of a free republic now was the message sent by the women of Germany to the women of the United States through Miss Jane Addams. We were at that moment heartily ashamed of our government. German women voting. American women going to jail and spending long hours in the Senate guardhouse without arrests or charges. The war came to an end. Congress adjourned November 20 first and the sixty fifth congress reconvened for its short and final session december second nineteen eighteen less than a month after our election campaign president wilson for the first time included suffrage in his regular message to congress the thing that we had asked of him at the opening of every session of congress since march nineteen eighteen there were now fewer than a hundred days in which to get action from the senate and so avoid losing the benefit of our victory in the house in his opening address to congress the president again appealed to the senate in these words and what shall we say of the women of their instant intelligence quickening every task that they touched their capacity for organization and cooperation which gave their action discipline and enhanced the effectiveness of everything they attempted their aptitude at tasks to which they had never before set their hands their utter self-sacrifice alike in what they did and in what they gave their contribution to the great result is beyond appraisal they have added a new luster to the annals of american womanhood the least tribute we can pay them is to make them the equals of men in political rights as they have proved themselves their equals in every field of practical work they have entered whether for themselves or for their country these great days of completed achievement would be sadly marred were we to omit that act of justice besides the immense practical services they have rendered the women of the country have been the moving spirits in the systematic economies in which our people have voluntarily assisted to supply the suffering peoples of the world and the armies upon every front with food and everything else we had that might serve common cause the details of such a story can never be fully written but we carry them at our hearts and thank god that we can say that we are the kinsmen of such again we looked for action to follow this appeal again we found that the president had uttered these words but had made no plan to translate them into action and so his second appeal to the senate failed coming as it did after the hostility of his party to the idea of conferring freedom on women nationally and had been approved and fostered by president wilson for five solid years he could not overcome with additional eloquence the opposition which he himself had so long formulated defended encouraged and solidified especially when that eloquence was followed by either no action or only half-hearted efforts it would now require a determined assertion of his political power as the leader of his party we made a final appeal to him as leader of his party and while still at the height of his world power to make such an assertion and to demand the necessary two votes chapter twenty the president sails away no sooner had we set ourselves to a brief hot campaign to compel president wilson to win the final votes than he sailed away to france to attend the peace conference sailed away to consecrate himself to the program of liberating the oppressed peoples of the world he cannot be condemned for aiming to achieve so gigantic a task but we reflected that again the president had refused his specific aid in a humble aspiration for the rosy hope of a more boldly conceived ambition it was positively impossible for us by our own efforts to win the last two votes we could only win them through the president that he had left behind him his message urging the senate to act is true that administration leaders did not consider these words a command is also true it must be realized that even after the president had been compelled to publicly declare his support of the measure it was almost impossible to get his own leaders to take seriously his words on suffrage and so again the democratic chairman of the rules committee in whose keeping the program lay had no thought of bringing it to a vote the democratic
Democratic chairman of the Woman's Suffrage Committee assumed not the slightest responsibility for its success, nor could he produce any plan whereby the last votes could be won. They knew, as well as we did, that the president only could win those last two votes. They made it perfectly clear that until he had done so, they could do nothing. Less than 55 legislative days remained to us. Something had to be done quickly, something bold and offensive enough to threaten the prestige of the president as he was riding in sublimity to unknown heights as a champion of world liberty, something which might penetrate his reverie and shock him into concrete action. We had successfully defied the full power of his administration, the odds heavily against us. We must now defy the popular belief of the world in this apostle of liberty. This was the feeling of the 400 officers of the National Woman's Party summoned to a three-day conference in Washington in December 1918. It was unanimously decided to light a fire in an urn and, on the day that the president was officially received by France, to burn with fitting public ceremonies all the president's past and present speeches or books concerning liberty, freedom, and democracy. It was late afternoon when the 400 women proceeded solemnly in single file from headquarters past the White House along the edge of the quiet and beautiful Lafayette Park to the foot of Lafayette's statue. A slight mist added beauty to the pageant. The purple, white, and gold banners, so brilliant in the sunshine, became soft pastel sails. Half the procession carried lighted torches, the other half banners. The crowd gathered silently, somewhat awestruck by the scene. Massed about that statues, we felt a strange strength and solidarity. We felt again that we were a part of the universal struggle for liberty. The torch was applied to the pine wood logs in the Grecian urn at the edge of the broad base of the statue. As the flames began to mount, Vida Milholland stepped forward and without accompaniment sang again from that spot of beauty in her own challenge challenging way, the woman's Marseille. Even the small boys in the crowd, always the most difficult to please, cheered and clapped and cried for more. Mrs. John Rogers, Jr., chairman of the National Advisory Council, said, as president of the ceremony, we hold this meeting to protest against the denial of liberty to American women. All over the world today we see urging and sweeping irresistibly on the great tide of democracy and women would be derelict in their duty if they did not see to it that it brings freedom to the women of this land. Our ceremony today is planned to call attention to the fact that President Wilson has gone abroad to establish democracy in foreign lands when he has failed to establish democracy at home. We burn his words on liberty today, not in malice or anger, but in a spirit of reverence for truth. This meeting is a message to President Wilson. We expect an answer. If the answer is more words, we will burn them again. The only answer the National Woman's Party will accept is the instant passage of the amendment in the Senate. The few hoots and jeers which followed all ceased when a tiny and aged woman stepped from her place to the urn in the brilliant torchlight. The crowd recognized a veteran. It was the most dramatic moment in the ceremony. Reverend Olympia Brown of Wisconsin, one of the first ordained women ministers in the country, then in her 84th year, gallant pioneer, friend and colleague of Susan B. Anthony said as she threw into the flames the speech made by the president on his arrival in France. I have fought for liberty for 70 years and I protest against the president's leaving our country with this old fight here unwon. The crowd burst into applause and continued to cheer as she was assisted from the plinth of the statue too frail to dismount herself. Then came the other representative women from Massachusetts to California, from Georgia to Michigan, each one consigned to the flames a special declaration of the president's on freedom the flames burned brighter and brighter and leapt higher as the night grew black the casual observer said they must be crazy don't they know the president isn't at home why are they appealing to him in the park opposite the white house when he is in france the long line of bright torches shone menacingly as the women marched slowly back to headquarters and the crowd dispersed in silence the white house was empty but we knew our message would be heard in france Chapter 21. Watchfires of Freedom. December came to an end with no plan for action on the amendment assured. This left us January and February only before the session would end. The president had not yet won the necessary two votes. We decided, therefore, to keep a perpetual fire to consume the president's speeches on democracy as fast as he made them in Europe. And so, on New Year's Day, 1919, we light our first watchfire of freedom in the urn dedicated to that purpose. We place it on the sidewalk in a direct line with the president's front door. The wood comes from a 
tree in Independence Square, Philadelphia. It burns gaily. Women with banners stand guard over the watchfire. A bell hung in the balcony at headquarters tolls rhythmically the beginning of the watch. It tolls again as the president's words are tossed to the flames. His speech to the working men of Manchester. His toast to the king at Buckingham Palace. We have used great words, all of us. We have used the words right and justice. And now we are to prove whether or not we understand these words. His speech at Brest. All turn into ignominious brown ashes. The bell tolls again when the watch is changed. All Washington is reminded hourly that we are at the president's gate burning his words. From Washington, the news goes to all the world. People gather to see the ceremony. The omnipresent small boys and soldiers jeer and some tear the banners. A soldier rushes to the scene with a bucket of water which does not extinguish the flames. Fire burns as if by magic. A policeman arrives and uses a fire extinguisher, but the fire burns on. The flames are as indomitable as the women who guard them. Rain comes, but all through the night the watch fire burns. All through the night the women stand guard. Day and night the fire burns. Boys are permitted by the police to scatter it in the street, to break the urn, and to demolish the banners. But each time the women rekindle the fire. A squad of policemen tries to demolish the fire. While the police are engaged at the White House gates, other women go quietly in the dusk to the huge bronze urn in Lafayette Park and light another watch fire. A beautiful blaze leaps into the air from the great urn the police hasten hither the burning contents are overturned alice paul refills the urn and kindles a new fire she is placed under arrest suddenly a third blaze is seen in a remote corner of the park the policemen scramble to that corner when the watch fires have been continued for four days and four nights in spite of the attempts by the police to extinguish them general orders to arrest are sent to the squad of policemen five women are taken to the police station the police captain is outraged that the ornamental urn valued at ten thousand dollars should have been used to hold a fire which burned the president's words his indignation leaves the defendants unimpressed however and he becomes conciliatory will the ladies promise to be good and light no more fires in the park instead the ladies inquire on what charge they are held not even the police captain knows they wait at the police station to find out refusing to give bail unless they are told meanwhile other women address the crowd lingering about the watch fire the crowd asks thoughtful questions. Little knots of men can be seen discussing what the whole thing is about anyway. Miss Mildred Morris, one of the participants, overheard the following discussion in one group composed of an old man, a young sailor, and a young soldier. But whatever you think of them, the sailor was telling the soldier, you have to admire their sincerity and courage. They've got to do this thing. They want only what's their right, and real men want to give it to them. But they've got no business using a sidewalk in front of the White House for a bonfire, declared the soldier. It's disloyal to the president, I tell you, and if they weren't women, I'd slap their faces. Listen, Sonny, said the old man, patting the soldier's arm. I'm as loyal to the president as any man alive, but I've got to admit that he ain't doing the right thing towards these women. He's forced everything else he's wanted through Congress, and if he wanted to give these women the vote badly enough, he could force the suffrage amendment through. If you and I were in the women's places, Sonny, we'd act real vicious. We'd want to come here and clean out the whole White House. But if the president doesn't want to push their amendment through, it's his right not to, argued the soldier. It's nobody's business how he uses his power. Good God, the sailor burst out. Why don't you go over and get a job shining the Kaiser's boots? The women were released without bail since no one was able to supply a charge. But a thorough research was instituted and out of the dusty archives, someone produced an ancient statute that would serve the purpose. It prohibits the building of fires in a public place in the district of columbia between sunset and sunrise and so the beautiful elizabethan custom of lighting watch fires as a form of demonstration was forbidden in a few days eleven women were brought to trial there was a titter in the courtroom as the prosecuting attorney read with heavy pomposity the charge against the prisoners to wit that on pennsylvania avenue northwest in the district of columbia they did aid and abet in setting fire to certain combustibles consisting of logs paper oil etc between the setting of the sun in the said district of columbia on the fifth day of january and the rising of the sun in the said district of columbia of the sixth day of january nineteen nineteen a d court is shocked to hear of this serious deed the prisoners are unconcerned call the names of the prisoners the judge orders the clerk calls julia emery no answer julia emery he calls a second time dead silence 
silence the clerk tries another name a second a third a fourth always there is silence in a benevolent tone the judge asks the policemen to identify the prisoners they identify as many as they can an attempt is made to have the prisoners rise and be sworn they sit we will go on with the testimony says the judge the police testify as to the important details of the crime they were on pennsylvania avenue they looked at their watch they learned it was about five thirty they saw the ladies in the park putting wood on fires in urns i threw the wood on the pavement they kept putting it back says one policeman each time i tried to put out the fire they threw on more wood says another they kept on lighting new fires and i'd keep putting them out says a third with an injured air the prosecuting attorney asks an important question did you command them to stop policeman i did sir and i said you ladies don't want to be arrested do you they made no answer but went on attending to their fires the the statute is read for the second time. Another witness is called. This time the district attorney asks the policeman, Do you know what time the sun in the District of Columbia set on January 5th and rose on January 6th? At this profound question the policeman hesitates, looks abashed, then says impressively, The sun in the District of Columbia set at 5 o'clock January 5th, rose at 7 o'clock January 8th. The prosecutor is triumphant. He looks expectantly at the judge. How do you know what time the sun rose and set on those days? asks the judge. From the weather bureau, answers the policeman. The judge is perplexed. I think we should have something more official, he says. The prosecutor suggests that perhaps an almanac would settle the question. The judge believes it would. The government attorney disappears to find an almanac. Breathless, the prisoners and spectators wait to hear the important verdict of the almanac. The delay is interminable. The courtroom is in a state of confusion. The prisoners especially are amused at the proceedings. It is clear their fate may hang upon a minute or two of time. An hour goes by, and still the district attorney has not returned. Another half hour. Presently he returns to read in heavy tones from the almanac. The policeman looks embarrassed. His information from the weather bureau differs from that of the almanac. His sun rose two minutes too early and continued to shine twelve minutes too long. However, it doesn't matter. The sun shone long enough to make the defendants guilty. The judge looks at the prisoners and announces that they are all guilty and shall pay a fine of five dollars or serve five days in jail. The administration has learned its lesson about hunger strikes and evidently fears having to yield to another strike, and so it seeks safety in lighter sentences. The judge pleads almost piteously with them not to go to jail at all and says that he will put them on probation if they will promise to be good and not light any more fires in the District of Columbia. The prisoners make no promise. They have been found guilty according to the almanac and they file through the little gate into the prisoner's pen. Somehow they did not believe that whether the sun rose at 726 or 728 was the issue which had decided whether they should be convicted or not and it was not in protest against the almanac that they straightway entered upon a hunger strike. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, the watch fires continued in the capital. January 13th, the day the great World Peace Conference under the President's leadership began to deliberate on the task of administering right and justice to all the oppressed of the earth, 23 women were arrested in front of the White House. Another trial. More silent prisoners. They were to be tried this time in groups. A roar of applause from friends in the courtroom greeted the first four as they came in. The judge said that he could not possibly understand the motive for this outburst and added, if it is repeated, I shall consider it contempt of court. He then ordered the bailiff to escort the four prisoners out and bring them in again. Shades of school days. And if there is any applause this time, with this threat still in the air, the prisoners re-entered and the applause was louder than before. Great confusion. The judge roared at the bailiff. The bailiff roared at the prisoners and their friends. Finally, they rushed to the corners of the courtroom and evicted three young women. Lock the doors and see that they do not return, shouted the angry judge. Thus the dignity of the court was restored. But the group idea had to be abandoned. The prisoners were now brought in one at a time, and one policeman after another testified that she kept a lightin' and a lightin' fires. Five days imprisonment for each woman who kept a light and watch fires. On January 25th in Paris, President Wilson received a delegation of French working women who urged woman suffrage as one of the points to be settled at the peace conference. The president expressed admiration for the women of France and told them of his deep personal interest in the enfranchisement of women. He was honored and touched by their tribute. It was a great moment for the president. He had won the position in the eyes of the world of a devout champion of the liberty of women, but at the very moment he was speaking to these French women, American women were lying in 
in the district of columbia jail for demanding liberty at his gates mrs mary nolan the eldest suffrage prisoner took to the watchfire those vain words of the president to the french women the flames were just consuming all sons of freedom are under oath to see that freedom never suffers when a whole squadron of police dashed up to arrest her there was a pause when they saw her age they drew back for an instant then one amongst them more dutiful than the rest quietly placed her under arrest as she marched along by his side cheers for her went up from all parts of the crowd say what you think about them but that little old lady certainly got pluck they murmured at the bar mrs nolan's beautiful speech provoked irrepressible applause the judge ordered as many offenders as could be recognized brought before him thirteen women were hastily produced the trial was suspended while the judge sentenced these thirteen to forty-eight hours in jail for contempt of court and so throughout january and the beginning of february nineteen nineteen the story of protests continued relentlessly watchfires arrest convictions hunger strikes release until again the nation rose in protest against imprisoning the women and against the senate's delay peremptory cables went to the president at the peace conference commanding him to act news of our demonstrations were well reported in the paris press the situation must have again seemed serious to him for although reluctantly and perhaps unwillingly he did begin to cable to senate leaders who in turn began to act on february second the democratic suffrage senators called a meeting at the capitol to consider ways and means on february February 3rd, Senator Jones announced in the Senate that the amendment would be brought up for discussion February 10th. The following evening, February 4th, a caucus of all Democratic senators was called together at the Capitol by Senator Martin of Virginia, Democratic floor leader in the Senate. This was the first Democratic caucus held in the Senate since war was declared, which would seem to point to the anxiety of the Democrats to marshal two votes. Several hours of every passionate debate occurred, during which Senator Pollock of South Carolina announced for the first time his support of the measure senator pollock had yielded to pressure by cable from the president as well as to the caucus this gain of one vote had reduced the number of votes lacking to one many democratic leaders now began to show alarm lest the last vote be not secured william jennings bryan was one leader who rightly alarmed over such a situation personally consulted with the democratic opponents the argument which he presented to them he subsequently gave to the press woman suffrage is coming to the country and to the world it will be submitted to the states by next congress if it is not submitted by the present congress i hope the democrats of the south will not handicap the democrats of the north by compelling them to spend the next twenty-five years explaining to the women of the country why their party prevented the submission of the suffrage amendment to the states this is our last chance to play an important part in bringing about this important reform and it is of vital political concern that the democrats of the northern mississippi valley should not be burdened by the the charge that our party prevented the passage of the suffrage amendment especially when it is known that it is coming in spite of if not with the aid of the democratic party as we grew nearer the last vote the president was meeting what was perhaps his most bitter resistance from within it was a situation which he could have prevented his own early hostility his later indifference and negligence his actual protection giving the democratic opponents of the measure his own reversal of policy practically at the point of a pistol the half-hearted efforts made by him on its behalf were all coming to fruition at the moment when his continued prestige was at stake his power to get results on this because of belated efforts was greatly weakened this also undermined his power in other undertakings essential to his continued prestige whereas more effort at an earlier time would have brought fairer results now the opponents were solidified in their opposition were through their votes publicly committed to the nation as opponents and were unwilling to sacrifice their heavy dignity to a public reversal of their votes this presented a formidable resistance indeed therefore the democratic blockade continued and so did the watchfires end of section eighteen recording by janet o'reilly of utah www.oreilly-fire.com